Well, hello everyone, and welcome to AIGA Design for Good webcast series. Today we have a, fi a fifth episode that will focus on racial justice. We entitle it Design Justice Practice, Spreading Power. Design Justice Practice, Racial Justice by Design. These are newish expressions that are provocative and question the role design can play. What role can design play when it, it's about busting bias, challenging stereotypes, preventing um, the access to public services for underserved communities? How do we break down the power dynamics? Um, how do we resist all these bias that are, um, that are in society today? This is sort of the questions um, that we will address today with, in the presence of two guests, Antoinette Carroll from St. Louis and Brian Lee Jr. in New Orleans. Those two social impact designers and activists will really look at how to turn civic engagement over its head with new methodologies, really questioning the role that designers can play and, and how they can empower the communities to truly become co-creators and not just recipients or beneficiaries of a design project. So we will uh, address in this webcast, um, you know, difficult conversations, some of which have started at AIGA last summer on the footsteps of the police brutality. And we had launched a town hall in July that tried to address some of these questions, what designers can do. But we'll go deeper also, not just questioning the role designers can, can have, but also what are the methodologies and what are the, um, the, the true tactics that, that can be used, really pushing forward values of self-determination. How do we empower community members to really have um, a role at the table and really ensure a balance of representation and not just, again, being fed the design Kool-Aid? We will use concrete um, case studies, um, and then we'll start with uh, Brian, uh, who will present a series of projects he has done in New Orleans. Then we'll pass it on to Antoinette. Then we'll have a little Q&A with them, and then we'll open the floor to questions. But please be, um, be uh, invited to, to send your questions along, to, uh, along the way. It's always nice to have them in, a, in storage, and then we will take them uh, together. Again, this series is AIGA Design for Good uh, webcast. It's uh, funded by the NEA with additional funding from IBM. And with no further ado, I pass it on to um, Brian Lee Jr., who is an architectural designer, a justice advocate, and founder of Colocate. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. What I often talk about, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about design justice at large and what that means, colloquial justice uh, for a just city. So colloquial design, meaning the informal, sophisticatedly informal use of design language as a whole uh, to speak to formal architectural or, or design precedent uh, at large. This really is a way for us to understand that culturally specific design plays an impact in the ways uh, in which we, we seek and attain outcomes in the built environment. So a lot of this work, uh, specifically in the architectural world, but I think more broadly in the, the, the design world, uh, stems from, uh, from this opportunity uh, that, that Whitney M. Young had back in 1968 uh, to speak to the AIA in Portland. Uh, what he spoke about was the lack of, of dignity to which our profession provides to the people in which it serves, the ways in which it overlooks and uh, ignores the depravity of the policies and procedures that are put in place in order to um, benefit oneself. Right? And so the idea is really that if we are able to think about uh, the, this specific sentence, and I'll, I'll tap that real quick. He talks about the fact that our profession is not a profession that has distinguished itself by its social and civic contributions. It is most distinguished by our thunderous silence and complete irrelevance. That's, that's a huge statement. It is a huge indictment of the work that an entire profession has done. Um, 
in the architectural profession proper, we're talking about health, safety, and welfare. And everybody knows what health is. Everybody knows what safety is. But the act of thinking about welfare, again, thinking about the positive emotional and physical response in space is tremendously important. And it allows us to think about the justice of the built environment in a very specific way. Uh, and so this is where we have an opportunity, at least within our profession to, to make progress. And that's where we've sought within my organization uh, to, to make that impact. So really this is what we're talking about. Culture and design have an evolutionary, uh, are evolutionary acts. Uh, culture and design are revolutionary acts. These are the ways in which uh, we seek uh, hope uh, in, in our lives, in our society, in our built environment. We seek to learn from our past. We seek to change uh, our future for the better. So evolutionary and revolutionary. So I always often talk about the fact that architecture is the hardware to the software of life. So design itself of the built environment, whether that's graphics, whether that's murals, whether that's architecture itself, um, they all play a part. And it's the software to the to the built environment or to the to the hardware that is our, our built environment. And culture, when we think about the ways in which culture manifests itself, it serves as the user interface. It serves as a way in which we are able to engage the complexities of both the built environment and our social existence and understand them. Uh, we're able to, to bring them into a space in which we can um, deliver a impactful understanding of that space so we can navigate it, right? So when we think about culture, we think about the ways that uh, music touches our hearts or the ways in which a painting can reveal something about uh, a true nature of self. Uh, all of these things are a part of uh, our expression and we use that to, to define so much. So when I talk about design justice, it is fundamentally about eliminating the privilege and power structures in design, creating a re-stratified profession that really shifts the way in which the profession at large, design profession, thinks about uh, imbuing or embracing community and whatever that means relative to you, right? You organize within your own community, but restratifying the community allows you to bring more people into the process, thusly uh, providing more opportunities to break down the privilege and power structures that that, that seek or put into place oppressive um, nature in our built environment. Uh, and so that allows us to design and speak the language of the people we serve tenfold. Um, one of the things I, I really like to talk about with this is the fact that when we talk about racism, when we th talk about systemic um, oppression, we oftentimes uh, conflate words, and words have true value, and that's one of the reasons I use the word colloquial, uh, because it is an informal use of formal language. Racism oftentimes is conflated with bigotry and prejudice, but they are not the same thing. A one-to-one -one interaction of bigotry or prejudice is not a long-term systemic, oppressive, uh, dehumanizing act based on somebody's, somebody's skin color. Uh, racism is, it is systemic. It is the way in which we place uh, policies and procedures that directly impact uh, those of a, uh, a, a different color or kind just because of that uh, consideration. And so we have to think about the separation between bigotry and, we, and, and systemic racism. Because nobody's, I mean, there are, there are people who are mad when we, when we have immediate uh, conflict around race. But the biggest issue, the issues that you see people protesting about are not because somebody was called a name. It's because somebody uh, used a system of power to hold people down. And so we have to think about the ways in which design does that, whether that's allowing people access to being a part of the profession or utilizing that profession as a means to continue uh, that oppression into the future or into public space. So that's huge. Uh, and so when we think about that, we have to think about it through those three lens, right? So what are, what are the policies, procedures, practice? And I usually add one more. What are the projects that come out of that? Um, and we think about the policies. Policies and procedures go hand in hand. They are the ideal condition to which we try to put things into the world. Procedures are the ways in which we just try to, to 
manage those policies. We try to functionally put those policies into play. Now, the translation between policy and procedure can be uh, an infinite myriad, but that's where we find conflict. That's where, you know, a policy about uh, you know, loitering turns into something else, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a, li uh, in a little bit. But where we have the opportunity to make change as a, as a practice, as a profession, is to think about the ways in which those policies and procedures can be impacted through our work. Uh, how can we advocate? How can we organize? How can we do projects that directly impact the ways in which policies and procedures are, are put into play? Uh, that Therein lies our, our direct uh, ability to make change. So I want to talk specifically about this and then I'll, I'll, I'll push through a, a few um, subsequent charges that talk about this in, in, in a little bit more uh, detail. But uh, in a few years back, Alton Sterling, I guess this is 2015 now, Alton Sterling was shot and murdered out in front of a corner store, which he had been selling CDs in front of for um, better knows of, of 10, 10 years. Uh, people knew him as a CD man. Uh, people knew this man. And this, this space was a safe space. And he was murdered. Eric Garner murdered in front of a corner store in New York, selling cigarettes. Um, again, these spaces, oftentimes in communities, are safe spaces. And so when you when you take away that opportunity, when you take away this space from people, you actually end up creating something that is is detrimental to a community at large. Uh, and the ways in which people do that, the policy, the policy, if we think about the policy that was uh, perpetrated in this particular condition, uh, it's, it's a vagrancy law. And the vagrancy law seeks to push away people who are serving and are in place uh, and, and considered loitering uh, in a, in a unlawfully loitering within a place. Now, vagrancy laws were used throughout the Black Codes in the 1800s, throughout Jim Crow in the early 1900s uh, as a way to criminalize blackness, to criminalize those who were freed, um, and, and to put them back into jail, right? And so that was a direct means, a procedure that was put in place to navigate a policy that was the 13th Amendment that essentially said all free people, uh, all people of color, enslaved people are now free unless you are uh, jailed or a felon. Uh, and so the vagrancy laws were, were huge ways to do that. And so that, when we think about the ways policies impact our, our future, our world, it has direct impacts from the 1800s to today. You see it happening and you see the impact of those things. So our job, specifically as an architect, is to think about the ways in which a corner store as a safe space is a bastion of hope for people and to acknowledge it and, and honor it. And we can see that in uh, the United States prison system, the ways in which that has perpetrated the same considerations. Uh, we can see it in the housing and urban development. Uh, when we look at the ways in which uh, redlining destroyed black communities, uh, destroyed the ways in which um, those communities were able to gain equity over time, we saw an increase. Uh, an, uh, an increase in property value and family wealth in middle class white families exponentially through late 1960s through the early 80s, specifically based on the impacts of redlining. And so when we talk about impoverished neighborhoods, when we talk about the fact that neighborhoods of color don't have uh, this, that, or the other, we can directly link it back to uh, the ways in which the policy of uh, the United States uh, impacted our spatial justice. Uh, and it continues again to this day. These are the spaces that are now being gentrified. When we talk about gentrification, we can't say it's a thing that happened today. It's a thing that happened, you know, 100 years ago, and it's now just reaping its its uh, benefits for those who sought to sow those those seeds. So there's a response. There's always a response to that. The, the Black Panther Party for Self Defense was a party that sought to provide food and shelter and safe spaces for people who were dealing with that oppression consistently. There's always going to be a response. Uh, so you saw that in separate but equal spaces, through schools, um, 
through Plessy versus Ferguson, the impact of that being uh, France School, which is the Ruby Bridges, uh, is who you see in this image right here. Um, fantastic uh, image in a in a in a painting that everybody fawned over. But this was a detrimental space for a young woman in New Orleans to have to go through to be the one to segregate a school, uh, to desegregate a school. Uh, and so again, responses, the Rosenwald schools built over 5,000 schools, Booker T. Washington and, and Julian, Julius Rosenwald uh, throughout the, the early 1900s to provide safe spaces, safe schooling for um, young children of color in the South over 5,000 schools. Uh, and these schools uh, pioneered a lot of the environmental uh, means and methods of, of uh, designing, designing schools, right? Because there was no air conditioning. There, was not a, there, there weren't a lot of those, those things that you would generally put in um, schoolhouses. And so they made do. Um, and so really what that means is that when we think about the ways in which we we impact design. I, I often show this picture because you know, the person who made this the sign on the left hand side, the colored entrance sign, that sign, that person went to work every day uh, and just designed a sign, right? They just designed a sign because that was their job and it's a beautiful sign. It's something that they had to do to get on to their next paycheck, get home to their wife or husband or children. And uh, not ever really thinking about the impact of this sign on place, on the people it was persecuting, the people it was oppressing. Um, that's super important. The other sign that you see is about the immediacy. It's still a sign, it's still designed, and it's still uh, a symbol of urgency. Uh, both of these pictures taken by Gordon Parks, uh, civil rights photographer, but I, I want people to, to fully understand the fact that Ignoring your impact on place and space uh, can show up in something as simple as a colored entrance sign uh, and, and have residual impact. So we have to be cognizant of our decisions. We have to be cognizant of the ways in which uh, we, we continue systems of oppression in the built environment. Um, so really, I want to talk to you a little bit about a few projects that have, have happened over the, the course of uh, uh, three years in New Orleans and uh, where where they're ending and, and where we're going into the to the future. So uh, this is Take Em Down NOLA. Uh, on the left far left hand side you see a friend, uh, Quest Michael Moore, who is leading activists in New Orleans around taking down symbols of, of supremacy and oppression. Um, along with Angela Kinlaw, they have led this for the last few years. And essentially what they've done is bring to bear a previous conversation that happened many, many years ago around, around these statues. Uh, let's take down symbols of oppression because they are the things that are, again, holding up, uh, exalting uh, a confederacy that not only lost, but uh, saw so much, uh, put so much of the residual hatred into our environment. And so they took about the task of, of changing uh, that. And so one of the things you can think about in New Orleans is, okay, do we have you know, a couple hundred black and brown bodies moving through the street in protest? Yes, that is one way in which we do that. But secondarily, what we think about is the fact that you know, two to three to four hundred black bodies, uh, black and brown bodies walking through the street in New Orleans is every Sunday. So it's, it's not as though, um, you know, a protest would be the only way to make an impact. Uh, so we thought we sought out to find a way to impact public space in a different way. The way that happened, we did a light projection onto um, Robert E. Lee, uh, um, this uh, podium here and uh, the Lee Circle statue is one that we've been reflecting on and talking about over time. One of the things we sought to do was to tell the whole story of Robert E. Lee, to talk about the fact that he owned 197 slaves, to talk about the fact that he was brutal uh, to the people that uh, were, were enslaved under him. Uh, these are all important facts that don't get um, lifted up when we just have a statue of somebody without the context of who they are in place and why they were so detrimental to us uh, to so many people. 
Um, this is the Battle of, of Liberty Place Monument. Um, this is a monument that was specifically dedicated to uh, the White League in, in New Orleans who attempted to overthrow the New Orleans government. And it's beyond me how this became a statue, but uh, that was there for a hundred years and it was specifically to honor those who actually shot up a police station and fought with the the, the New Orleans government to try to overthrow it. Um, the federal guards have to be called in to take that down. This was in honor of that and three weeks ago we were able to finally have it removed. So in doing so this long march toward uh, spatial justice was one step closer to where we wanted it to be. Um, so all of this revolves around getting back to how we think about uh, the, the needs of the built environment. So once we get past the, the visuals that continue to oppress us, we think about the functional needs of the built environment and we continue to push forward on that. So shelter, food, health care, safety, education, commerce, uh, entertainment, public space. So all huge things. So I'm going to tell you about two other projects that we do to, to kind of think through this stuff and to, to perpetrate justice within the, the built environment. So I run a project called uh, Project Pipeline. These are as-built workshops in which young people and community members think specifically about uh, the way space can be intervened and then built into uh, cities and neighborhoods that have direct impact. These young people take the time to think about those injustices in the built environment and design solutions directly for them. Uh, they've got four days and they really, really dig into that. Uh, one of the other ways is a project called Design as Protest. We run this nationally uh, on J20, on January 20th. We actually had over 600 people across the country come together to do a des design day of protest and to think about the ways in which uh, we have an administration that is uh, perpetrating or, again, perpetuating some of those, those issues. And all of this uh, I like to say that, you know, to protest is to have an unyielding faith in the potential for a just society and design at its best should aspire to have such character. Um, this is super important because protest is not angry. It is not, it is not about the anger. Let me, let me not say it's not angry because we are angry a lot of times, but it is not about the anger. It is about wanting a better future. It is about hoping for a better answer to injustice that has long since been past its 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 sale date. Uh, and so note that whenever you see protesters in the street, you know that they are simply hosting and wanting a better future for them, their kids, their grandkids, uh, so on and so forth. So these are some of the conversations we've had. Uh, you know, what are, what are the things that you're most worried about? Um, and then what are the other concerns? I'm going to talk to you lastly about one project. These are, again, some of the things that we've been working through. Uh, these are the ways in which we've sought to, to address them, whether that's immigration reform, affordable housing, mm, justice reform, and people design these things in place in time. The last thing I'll talk about is a new way for us to think about doing concept sets for documents and architecture. Uh, Claiborne Midline is a project we're currently working on. We have we host your 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 typical um, you know community meeting, uh, but what we do is we host a we we draw up a, a concept set that designs a space based on the feedback we get from communities, and then instead of annotating it with material annotations, we actually talk about the annotations from the people. Uh, what did they want? What were their concerns? What did they need? Uh, and then that gave the people of the community the opportunity to, to respond to the, the visual and the physical space rather than, um, rather than a set of documents that did not have any response. So this is what that looks like, and I'd be open to having any kind of conversation as we move forward uh, on this. Thank you for giving me your time, and uh, I'm going to turn this over to Antoinette to wrap up. Thank you, Brian. I just love the way you mix um, history, policy history, real architecture, environments, people, places, power. It's a Thank great, you. it's a great storytelling mode. Thank you. So we're going to call now Antoinette Carroll. Uh, Antoinette is 
a familiar, let me just get this out, Antoinette is a familiar face and voice to AIGA. Um, she is um, a designer, a social impact designer and activist. She's the founder and executive director of Creative uh, Reaction Lab. She's also the president of the chapter of AIGA in St. Louis. And because she has, you know, a lot of time on her on her plate, she's also the founder of the AIGA Diversity and Inclusion Task Force that is sitting here at the national office, as well as the chair of the equivalent at the St. Louis chapter. So I'm just naming a few of her current title. I won't go through the entire biography, but thank you for being here, Antoinette. Um, I have the privilege of working with you on a number of um, projects um, at AIGA, and it's nice to have you in this conversation that you have been uh, leading um, and, and you know, uh, pushing us to really think about this uh, race issue and how design can actually tackle it as a problem. So I'm going to let you speak, um, and then we'll bring you back with, with Brian uh, for uh, a Q&A. Well, thank you, Leticia. Thank you, Brian. It was such a phenomenal uh, presentation. And I, when we talked about having this webinar um, for all the attendees, one of the things I said is I want Brian to go first. And the reason why I said this is because I knew he would provide the historical context and really have us start thinking about the systemic nature of these issues in which we're trying to address. We are trying to address issues that are century long and you know it's one that is, is not an easy feat and it's not going to be dismantled in our lifetime you know many times people hear about racism or any type of ism or any type of systemic oppression and our fight for equity and say well it, it can't be accomplished why are you doing this and so my type of mindset and my the way I think is that you know these are all drops in the bucket ultimately especially in my instance and I can tell from Brian for me it's about how do we create a snowball effect how do we create a network so you know I'm doing my effort he's doing his work there's thousands and millions out there also doing their work and how do we continue to impact others that can continue to fight for this over time so that I'm going to actually show some slides, not as you know, fantastic as Brian's, uh, but I, I would like to share my experience. So give me one second. My conversation starts in August 9th, 2014. And what's interesting is that some people believe that this is when I start doing the work and that uh, is not necessarily the case. Uh, and so August 9th, 2014 uh, was the day that Michael Brown Jr. was killed in uh, Ferguson, Missouri and his body laid out in the middle of the street for hours upon hours without any governmental assistance. As a resident of St. Louis, Missouri, uh, which is where Ferguson is located, many people are not aware of that, this was something that was highly impactful uh, on me in my life as well as uh, in my career. Prior to this, we had already started the Diversity Inclusion Task Force at AIGA. We actually had decided June 2014 to start this task force. And then August 9th happened also in the same year, which was something that I will say woke us up as an institution, but then also woke us up as a city. Now what's interesting is that at this time, St. Louis, Missouri was in the process of celebrating our 250th birthday. And so you have half of the city saying, oh, you know, let's host galas, let's have birthday cakes. Literally, there were birthday cakes throughout the entire city. And, you know, constantly looking at this celebratory type of, you know, session or time. And then there was another half of the city, the half of the city that majority of the time is forgotten, in which they are, they use August 9th as a way to start bringing voice to the concerns they've had. They've been forgotten, they've been erased, they have not been brought to the table. And so, you know, what, what are we going to do to address these systemic things? And at the time, I was head of communications at a nonprofit called Diversity Awareness Partnership, head of communications and design. And not only was I in the room with many of these diversity and inclusion practitioners, but I also was in the room with AIGA, and other design professions, and we were asking the questions, what should we do? 
and we received the stereotypical response, which is what we like to do as graphic designers. Let's do a poster campaign. Let's do a social media meme campaign. Let's, you know, use our methodology of and our, our method a method of craft to build awareness around this. But that wasn't enough for me because I've seen the opportunity and the beauty of cross-sector collaboration of intersectionality. And I also recognize the talent of designers beyond hey, let's get in front of our computer and do something. And so I started to ask the question of why should designers and why should creatives be part of this process? Now, many people ask why design? We all know this at the table. We recognize that design is everywhere. That's just the reality of the situation. People outside of design doesn't recognize it because design is an invisible innovation. It was a disruption before disrupt became the buzzword that it is now. And the thing about design is that you know it's done well when it's invisible. And so many people didn't really think to naturally call designers. But there was another reason why I wanted designers to be at the table. And that was excuse me, that systems of oppression, injustice, and inequities are designed. Brian alluded to this when he brought up the fact that there's race and there's racism, and then there's also systemic racism, there's structural racism, and there's times in which I like to say that we have chronic, we have chronic racial oppression. And the reality is, is that these are design decisions. These are not individual, one individual act and then that's it. These are systems, these are networks that were built. And so my mind is that if we have, if this was designed, if these decisions were designed, if these policies were designed, if these actions were designed, then why don't we use design to challenge them? Why don't we use design to try to dismantle them? Because the reality is, is if something's been designed, that means that we can address it. It is not natural. It is human made. And so we can have human made responses to address it. So at the time in 2014, it was Creative Reaction Lab, which is now a nonprofit organization. It was just an event. It was a 24-hour event in which we brought designers together to address issues of racial inequality and police brutality. And what was interesting about this is that it wasn't just let's again get behind our computers, but it was also educational component. It was you know ideation. It was all the different little all the words in the process that we like to throw out now. And it was about challenging our own preconceived biases and assumptions and also lack of knowledge to then try to develop approaches to address them. And so there was over 60 ideas that were pitched that ranged from looking at media narration such as this problem uh, process, excuse me, project right here to also talking about the talk in the African American community. Whereas there were individuals in the room that had to ask, but well, what's the talk? And in the African American community, we know it well. It's the talk of safety, it's the talk of assimilation, it's the talk of what you should do whenever you are essentially placed in a situation in which your color has thus been your, defined as your identity alone. And so we have projects that touched many of these different areas. Ultimately, five were worked on throughout the night. We had all five activated in St. Louis within a year. There are two that are still active to this day. One that was turned into an organizational framework for civic creatives, and one that also was integrated within a high school curriculum. And so very much seeing kind of this long-term impact. This was almost two and a half years ago. Long-term impact of the work uh, in which we were doing. And so this project you see here is Cards Against Brutality. And this project was directly looking at media narration and media framing. How many times we put labels on individuals, and we see this in um, sexism and things of that nature, we put labels on people to define who they are. I like to say that thug is the new N-word. And you know, if they wanted to take, a, take that narration back and say, well, these were someone's children, these were someone's student, these were someone's daughter, mother, so on and so on. But then we also had a project that was looking at uh, how do we address an idea of a culture of fear? Because a culture of fear is very real. It's, the re it's things that kind of dictate our actions and, and what we're doing, and in many cases, our biases, our unconscious biases that we're not even aware of. There's actual research and stats that shows that there is a culture of fear of the black male, that more than likely we're 
going to cross the street or we're going to clutch our purse or we're going to move to the side in the elevator. The movie Crash a few years ago uh, was trying to address this head on. And so this project wanted people to really start to have conversations about things they're fearful of and how that dictate our actions and how we need to become more conscious of it so that we don't let our biases direct who we are as individuals. Then we had a project of uh, looking at stereotyping. And I would say this was probably the most kid-friendly one in which youth were able to take this and reinvent this and look at it as how do we address bullying uh, in a, opposed to just saying stereotyping. But you know, in this instance, they were looking at this idea of in identity and individuality. Stereotyping is the opposite of that. Stereotyping and assumptions are saying, I define you as this. Whereas this project says, okay, you've been stereotyped, but now own your identity and recognize that we are intersectional, recognize that we have many different identities that define us, and then be proud of it and stand and you know connect as a community around the fact that we are who we are and we and it's a beautiful thing. And then another project. Uh, was looking at this idea of civic matchmaking. And this project was created by another designer uh, named Deandra Nichols. She was on our racial justice by design town hall conversation last year. And this project, one of her many, uh, was looking at this idea of matchmaking around civic issues. You know, we have Tinder, we have Match.com, we have all these different uh, technological tools to find our soulmate or, you know, a side piece if that's what you're looking for. But with this, this project was looking at how do we take that concept and have people come together to come up with civic-based solutions and they're actually enacted. And so this project gave the community power or allowed them to amplify their power when it had uh, closed because the intention for this project was only during the protest they had over 700 actions that had occurred because of this one website and the effort they were around uh, building around community building and action and so going through this process i realized and especially even as an organization i realized that it is more than traditional design that we need to do. It's more than having traditional designers at the table. But in reality, what we actually need to do is redefine design and designers. And we need to recognize that there's technically trained designers, but then there's also designers in the commonality. And that every decision we're making is a design decision. And we need to ask our question, are we developing or designing a better world through our actions and through our decisions? And so there's many times in which I have this conversation in which I tell people that human-centered design is not enough. Design thinking is not enough. I was just at a TEDx in Virginia this past weekend, and one of the presenters, he works around a cancer research for youth, and particularly looking at how children are dying at an, an astronomical rate due to cancer. And he brought up the slide of design thinking and said, well, I love the process. Design thinking is not going to fix this. And that's one of the things we need to have a conversation about as, as an industry and saying, okay, how do we use our talent, use our processes, use our mode of thinking, but then also recognize our own different issues that we need to address to truly create a just design decision. And so my organization, Creative Reaction Lab, we have a process we use called equity-centered design. And equity-centered design doesn't start with empathy, but we actually start with humility. Because you can't empathize with individuals when you haven't even focused on your own stereotypes, assumptions, and biases that you have that may come into play when trying to empathize. But then also we look at this area of co-creation. And not saying, hey, let's just put a CEO, a Burger King worker, and an artist in a room and make it happen. But And, you know, as long as you have a good facilitator, it's going to be great. But recognize that for the long haul, we need to also look at those power dynamics and look at those barriers that are going to limit the, uh, the, uh, the authenticity of the work that we could create. And so we kind of holistically are looking at these issues. So this is just one tool that we use uh, when having conversations with communities and trying to essentially be make them become community designers, because that's our goal. It's like, we want to create a new form of a civic leader. We want to redefine what a community designer can be and then empower people that are either technically trained designers and not, 
uh, uh, everyday designers, as uh, some in the space like to say, and give them the ability to design a better uh, community when addressing this issues or many systemic issues. And so this is our table of collaboration and co-creation process in which we recognize that everyone brings an expertise to the table and everyone has value. Now there's many times when we talk about power, I've heard some people say, well, everyone has power. I personally do not believe everyone has power because there's many people in the world that are trying to get by through the basic needs, if we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that are trying to have a shelter, that are trying to have food, that are literally chronic, dealing with chronic you know, health issues and things of that nature in which they are trying to survive before they can even get to this point of power and decision making. But I will say I believe that majority of people have power and it's all about bringing the individuals up to recognize their power and then in some cases kind of leaning in and allowing some people to kind of share that power space with you when you are privileged to have that type of power. So go through very quickly uh, kind of this highlight of the expertise and values in which we want when bringing, or not necessarily want, but we recognize when bringing people to the table. So the first is the creative sector, which are pretty much us, but it also includes entertainers, it includes theater performers, it includes musicians and public artists and, you know, essentially these creators, these makers. And we recognize that we're problem solving and creativity experts. We build something out of nothing every single day. And we also, you know, are building for public engagement, public consumption. I think when Brian was talking about the signage in which the individuals that came in and created the colored uh, people, this is your doorway sign, you know, that was created for people engagement. The architectural structures were created for people engagement. Even the logos were created for people engagement because ultimately institutions are led by people. And so when we recognize that ability, to connect with people and thus define culture, we recognize the value and expertise that we bring to the table. Then we have the social and civic sector. And these individuals are the frontline responders to an issue. They know the policy, theory, and history of a problem. They are able to provide you with a holistic approach of whatever issue you're trying to address. Now, one thing I will say in all of this, everyone has to display a sense of vulnerability. And also, of course, in designers, we recognize that while it may not have worked in one setting, it may potentially work in another. And so in this industry, sometimes there's pushback because, well, we tried that, it didn't work. Or they, they're so budget stricken that they honestly are just kind of trying to move, move, move because that's all they can do. And so in this situation, we're looking at cross-sector engagement, but then also recognizing, again, the barriers that come into play to, to using these expertise and values to the greatest way possible. Then we have the business sector. And honestly, we, we like to call them for money because they have money. But, you know, there's a reason why they have it. It's because they know about feasibility and scalability and viability and essentially looking at it through a way of sustainability. How are we going to sustain what we're doing? And when we're addressing systemic issues such as this, while one-offs are great, we need sustainable efforts. And so we need the individuals that are going to think about how are we going to sustain this going forward. And then lastly, but definitely not least, we need our community members. And Arguably, many times they are not included at the table when it comes to decision making. We'll sometimes call them in uh, if you know we are a little bit more advanced. We'll call them in for their expertise. Uh, you know, we do participatory budgeting, things like that in the community. And then you know, there's what I like to call fake participatory engagement, in which we bring people in and say we want your opinion through town halls, things of that nature. However, you know, we essentially only, we already made our decisions. We just want you to come in and give us a little bit of insight on what we decided. Whereas in this situation, we recognize that they are the living experts. They know the day-to-day -day impact and of whatever we're trying to address. Now, many times we have to shift our language because honestly, we traditionally like to use a lot of lingo uh, and vernacular. But if you were to go to someone, and I'll use myself as an example, I grew up lower income. I don't shy away from that. I recognize that that is something that made me who I am today. And growing up, I thought that making $19,000 was a lot. I thought that, that was my goal in life because that's what I was taught. So I grew up in poverty. But I also 
thought that I received a quality education. I thought that incarceration was the norm. I thought that all these different things in which I was seeing in my community was commonality. And so if someone was to come to me and say, tell me about the school to prison pipeline, I would have no idea what they were talking about. But if they were to say, ask me, how many times have you been suspended? How many times have your family members been su suspended? Have you seen anyone incarcerated in your family? I can give you any of that information because I've experienced it. And I know exactly how it impacts our community, even at a basic level. So this is an example, a sample of a woman that I like to call a community designer in our, uh, in our community. Her name is Nicole Hudson. Uh, when Ferguson occurred, she was a communications director. She, was, she wasn't a designer. She was more of a writer, more of a strategist. And an institution called uh, the Ferguson Commission asked her to come on as a communications director because she did such a phenomenal job. And she recognizes these issues as communication issues when you talk about racism, there are communication issues. When you talk about these issues, there are awareness issues. She recognized that it's partially due to that. She took a, took a communication stance to it. She did such a great job. They asked her to be the leader of the nonprofit that kind of was built out of it uh, called uh, Ford through Ferguson. Again, led it through a communications lens. Because of the work that she did, they thus, thus asked her to be the senior policy advisor on strategic initiatives and racial equity, the first position ever to be created like that in a governmental agency in St. Louis. And it's because she saw the power of creation and saw the power of awareness when challenging these issues. And then there's individuals like Travis Sheridan. Travis Sheridan, he is what you truly call a communication, uh, community designer. Uh, he himself likes to say that he's a designer without the actual craft. <laughs> um, but, you know, with him, he believes in building serendipitous collisions. He's around co designing collaboration, connection, and communities. And so he looks at, does this through art. Uh, he also does it through, um, you know, community gatherings, as well as uh, his favorite thing, which is beer through programs such as Booze Storming. And so when looking at the power that we all can bring to the table when addressing these systemic issues and looking at the value that we can bring to the table, we thus can become the researchers, we can become the teachers, the strategists, the doers. And when we do that, when we start to address these implicit biases, when we start to lead with humility opposed to empathy, when we start to think about it through the lens of creation and co-creation while addressing barriers, we then are able to you know, build civic engagement through creative problem solving. And we are able to transform our communities and transform it more than just change. We want more than change, we want transformation. And when we do that, that's when we're going to systemically start to dismantle some of these issues. And so the last thing I just wanna leave you with is that you need to move beyond, you know, the, our less work with each other and, you know, people that make us feel comfortable because you understand my language, but we need to work with each other to co-create and address these issues holistically because if we don't start to do cross-sector work, if we don't start with self, we are then going to continue to perpetuate the issues that are there and it's just going to continue to go on and on over the years. Thank you. Oh, thank you, everyone. So thank you, Antoinette, for a fantastic presentation. Really great compliment to what uh, Brian addressed. Um, I'm going to jump here with a couple of comments and questions, and mm -hmm. then we'll open up to the floor. Certainly. What I, I heard, um, I might hear myself. Uh, I heard an interesting uh, word that Brian used, uh, strata. Uh, stratification of mm -hmm. the design profession and you uh, Antoinette mentioned this idea of a community designer um, I think that there's something really powerful in this idea and I would love to hear more about it how do you go about training someone who is engaged in this seemingly design conversation without necessarily using the word design for as a matter of fact but sort of this idea that you mentioned to me, Brian, uh, on the phone earlier, which I love this metaphor of why is the healthcare system with uh, not just doctors, but also nurses? The mm -hmm. nurses are here to support the doctors. Mm -hmm. Why can't we do the same thing for the design profession? Yeah, I mean, Can you I certainly, expand on this? 
I sure can. So the idea being that you know, if you lose 40% of the profession in nurses, you're actually losing the people who who touch the patients, who are there for them at their bedside, who talk to them when they need to, uh, so on and so forth. That's actually what we're missing from the design profession at, at large. We're missing the people who are ground level, who are, you know, checking the, the heartbeat of the community. And they exist. That's the problem is that they exist so much so that uh, when you reach out to artists or you reach out to activists, they are excited to be a part of this process in ways, you know, Antoinette and I work with artists and activists all the time uh, and are part of that community. And so when you hear it and you see it and you know that, that they are every bit as capable, they know all of this information, they know all of the history, uh, you recognize the fact that they can have an exponential impact on our processes very easily. And there are already systems in place in other professions that allow this to work, whether that's paralegals or whether that's nurses uh, and the like. So we as designers have systemically, again, through process, we've said, you know, at least in architecture, you've got to go through seven years of design practice in order to uh, be an architect, and that's all. There's no other way into the profession. There's no other way to, to interact. Well, that's, that's bull mm -hmm. if you're actually trying to make any real change. Yeah, I 100% agree with that, and that's actually why we are uh, focusing on building uh, essentially an army of community designers. You know, whether it's, you know, structurally or systemically recognized, we're still going to do the work. You know, I will be honest, I, I've known as someone that challenges the status quo. Uh, I'm known as someone that essentially likes to build, um, to create things better. And so for me, whether we have buy-in from, I will say, the leaders in design or not, you know, we're going to, I'm going to continue to build the, that community. And I can't tell you how many times people have come to me saying, how do you do with you do, what you do? And it's traditional designers with craft. And then there's also, to Brian's point, community leaders. There's, you know, people that's working in nonprofits. There's people that are activists on the ground. There's, you know, artists. There's youth, you know, that are saying, how can we use design practices to, you know, address these larger issues? And I will say, you know, the, the thing about design, it is a new field. You know, and I say new as in language is assigning not new as in what we've done because design has always been around we just now gave it a term essentially and so with the work that we're doing we're like i said using our, our methodology to build up that new uh, army and kind of amplify the work and say you know designers you can be part of this process as well traditional designers but then recognize that we do have to share power for that to happen Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly, which was the idea of spreading pow power, not yeah. powder, power. Um, I think that maybe could it be like a challenge for AIGA to, um, you know, in a way like question the uh, very hierarchical design profession and question whether this idea of like democratization of design power, because let's just put those two words together, um, is is something that's a little scary and and you know questioning a lot of the sort of established um, master apprentice model the paradigms of you know as you were saying Brian like you need to be an sort of accredited architects to practice architecture while you know the rest of the world is building architecture left and right without any no. architect to start with have. right <laughs> so. That is absolutely correct. I mean, so one of the things you said, um, yes, I do believe AIGA should. I do believe that AIGA should also connect with AIA and ASLA and the Urban League, uh, not Urban League, but, well, yeah, Urban <laughs> League also, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the Urban Planners organizations, all of the organizations actually that are dealing with the built environment graphically or otherwise should be talking and in the same room in the same way that we're attempting to bring together voices at a ground level uh, that are able to speak to this work. We have to say at the top level who, you know, these systems that are in place, there has to be some unilateral conversations at the top mm -hmm. as well. Um, because, you know, we're not always going to be able to push through and this fight may, may not end with us. It definitely won't end with us. But, you know, that conversation 
will only change when it starts with with uh, both sides pushing pushing it from from both ends. And the last thing I would add, I don't know if we have any questions from the audience, but um, you know, AIG is in this position of power. You know, that is honestly one of the greatest assets for AIG is that they are able to reach in places that others cannot. You know, they and whether it's you know corporate engagement or whether it's you know convening designers. If AIGA was to say, "Hey, all other design institutions, you know, service design institutions, uh, SCGD, the ones that Brian mentioned, let's come together and have a larger conversation around uh, addressing these systemic issues and you know, kind of the the hierarchy within our own industries," they could do that. You know, they will receive a callback. Whereas individuals at a you know base ground level could try that and may not ever hear back. <laughs> I mean that's just the reality. And so, yeah. do I think AI should do it? AIGA should do it. Of course. You know, I that's one of the things I continually push through through the diversity and inclusion work. And as Leticia knows, I've even on the design for good space a little bit, and you know all these different areas. I'm constantly pushing. How do we become collaborative, and yeah. not just collaborative where it's agenda leading. But looking at the agenda as the larger institution and uh, industry overall, and really right. start to look at it through the lens of social innovation, opposed to kind of just individual development or practice or professional practice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We we have one question um, that I thought was interesting about going back to this notion of empathy and humility that you you mentioned, Antoinette. Um, someone asked Brian, like, what was it like to build empathy or with the people that were involved in these statues um, uh, in New Orleans, and, and maybe the ones even that were not understanding what you were trying to do? It, how 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 did you sort of um, establish a connection and communications with those people? Yeah, I mean, it was mostly through the the kind of interfacing in the built environment. It wasn't a lot of you know, when you're dealing with something that has been rooted for so long, uh, building empathy with those who don't seek your own humanity or seek to, to dehumanize you is very, very difficult. And so what we attempted to do was just reveal layer by layer by layer uh, all of the, the story, right? And I think when people who were on the fence uh, about any of these statues were able to get the full clarity of the story, you started to see the, the shed towards the side of, of taking them down. So it wasn't necessarily about approaching those who are fully on the other side. And I, I, I shit you not, there's a, 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 a I'll attribute this to my dear friend, Abdul Aziz, who, who's been writing some really wonderful stuff for, for um, City, City Lab. Uh, he interviews and has been taking a lot of uh, shots during the, the uh, taking down of the monuments. One of the Confederate people essentially said, um, in looking at the, the statue of Jefferson Davis coming down, this feels like a lynching. You know, I mean, like, without irony, like, that is, so it's very hard to build empathy with, with people of that nature. Now, like I said, <laughs> those who were on the fence were able to understand how dire it is when you have something like that said, or when you tell the full story of the amount of slaves someone owns, or you, you protest in the street, though that's where you win the battle. Mm -hmm. um, there's another term that you use several times, um, safe space. I, I found it very interesting that you use it in the sort of built environment context, and you s used it in um, places where precisely that sort of seemingly safe space of common everyday activity, street uh, life was certainly challenged, and. Uh, where police brutality happened in front of everyone. And I know that the diversity and inclusion um, uh, conversation at AIGA, but also in general, has, has sort of advocated for this safe space. And I'm wondering whether you guys think that it's the right, um, it's really the right term or the right notion to keep in mind when, in fact, we're all trying to uh, use our democratic rights. I mean, why is protesting such a big deal in America? It's like it's it's your right as a citizen, right? So, I, I'm just curious to know how you guys both take the this notion uh, or use it or not use it mm -hmm. or expend on. You know, that's, I mean, these, that's, these conversations are healthy conversations. They might be violent, they might be uh, uncomfortable, 
I mean, the, 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 the statue is a good example of like how a symbol is suddenly like crumbling, right? It's both physical, visual, architectural. Yeah. It's a community that's, that's questioning all this. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think when it comes to safe spaces, so it, one, safe space is in the, the eye of the beholder. And I think we need a combination of both. We need safe spaces, but then we also need those spaces in which we are uncomfortable and which dissent happens. Because I, I tell people all the time, when doing this work, you know, we need dialogue and we need action. No, we don't need debate. We need dialogue, which is something we don't do enough of. Uh, but, but then, you know, when doing this work, it is messy. It is, a, and dissent is encouraged. Like if we... I'll use an example of um, it was last year that we held workshops and labs around this larger issue of gun violence. And I kid you not, in one room, one half of the room were like, no, guns are the issues, burn them, and we need to be like Australia, let's get them rid of them all. And then the other side of the room was like, guns are not the issue, it's people. You know, we need to address the issue with people. And then, you know, even one of the teams that came up with um, their project idea, which I didn't share today, uh, it was called Body Count, but they were showing the economic impact of uh, a lost death and as a ba is based in cities because they wanted to reach across to communities that have a tendency to say uh, that that's not my issue, that's not my problem, that's not my community, you know, why should I care? And so it... it it is messy, and there are times in which you need to be in people's face, which is where protesting, uh, and it is, that's why protesting is different than marches. Uh, we, you know, when you're in people's face and you're saying, you know, enough is enough. We need change. We need action. We need something to do. We need to really challenge these issues. But then also there's moments in which we need safe space because, honestly, being a black woman, it is tiring sometimes. I mean, it really is. I mean. Brian said it earlier, he was like, yeah, sometimes we are angry. I can't say we're not angry. Literally, Baldwin said to constantly to look at the, the the racism in our world, honestly, we would constantly be in anger when we think about it. I mean, when we really think about the fact that I have to pay attention to what I'm wearing, and that kind of depicts how people will treat me. I've been treated differently in the same hospital if I had on jogging pants versus if I had on my business clothes. Like, that is... That is a reality. And so sometimes I need a safe space uh, where, and in my organization we call it cultural history and healing, I need a space to heal. I need a space to address these issues that are systemically uh, impacting me. And so I, I think we need essentially both uh, yeah. to kind of address these issues. Right. Yeah. Yeah, to, to my instance, I think there's two you know, words mean an awful lot and safe space when it comes to debate or dialogue around racial or cultural issues is one thing. Safe spaces within communities free from the oppressive forces that are constantly encroaching, that is is more what I, what I am referring to when I say that. So if I know that I have beat cops that are always, always walking my block, Right. If that is constantly a thing, it raises the the consideration. I hear a lot of actually women talk about street harassment in the same fashion. That is that it's always um, you're always in pursuit. Somebody's always in pursuit, and it always feels like there's there's something behind you uh, coming for you. Um, that is essentially the same thing when you're talking about. Uh, police officers in some of these communities, you always feel tight. You always feel like somebody is on the cusp of, of taking your life away from you. And that is a horrible way to walk through your environment uh, constantly on edge. So safe space is really about those spaces where you don't have to feel uh, like, you know, this could come to an end in an instant. Right. And it, there are the, the beautiful definition also of public space. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we have to wrap up. Okay, I have to look over there. We have to wrap up. Um, I have one last question to uh, close, which is actually from the public. And that is, um, and please keep it short. Uh, what's your favorite ways of engagement? Is it um, the town hall? Is it a community gathering? Is it a social media campaign? I mean, if any, I'm sure it's a combination of everything, but if you could just close on like your personal experience using these different tactics of engagement mm -hmm. and uh, telling us which one you prefer. So I'm going to quickly 
ish yeah. answer. <laughs> uh, because when we started our, our engagement were um, community labs, is what we used to call them, community reaction labs, which were 24 hour labs. Uh, we also did shorter form ones. And uh, we saw a great amount of diversity that attended and also the sense of empowerment. However, that being said, and I, this is why I said ish, um, we now have built actual structure where it's like a year long program that youth. Uh, participate in that community members kind of engage in that throughout the process where we are looking at kind of longer term um, learning as well as longer term community engagement because again mm -hmm. one off events are great um, but we're trying to address systemic issues and so we need to right. kind of longer form processes to make it happen. Right, yeah. like an after school program. Yeah, so for me I, I would say very similar actually. I, I appreciate organizing um, and so the idea, so I have a, a program, we built a board game called The Just City uh, and one of the programs I showed you earlier, Project Pipeline, and so we go into schools and we teach thousands of students across the country uh, about social justice through design. Uh, the board game itself is really interesting. I love the board game so it's very interesting for me to, to work mm -hmm. with students see them uh, work through and understand. I mean, that's the thing key within like two weeks, they understand the ways in which neighborhoods have um, those those uh, positive, positive and negative detractors and they are able to respond to them in kind. So yeah, that's probably the way that I, I find most endearing to, to, to a better engage. monopoly, a better monopoly yeah. game. Yeah, yeah, I think so. yeah. Well, thank you both of you for a fantastic conversation. I could stay here the entire afternoon and continue engaging with you. I'm sure the audience would have more questions for us, but I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I really want to continue this conversation Absolutely. at AIGA and we're in the midst of trying to figure it out. What okay. format does it take? Who is engaged in it? What do we do about it? But um, well, tweet us fantastic. and ask us questions and get involved. I'm at yes. designjusticeplatform.org and uh, colocate.com.org and come see us. Yep, and yeah. creativereactionlab.com and a curl design on Twitter as well as Creative Reaction Lab on Twitter. Thank you Thank again, you. both of you. So this video will be um, with closed captions and it will be put up on our YouTube channel uh, to join five other videos that have been um, recorded over the past six months. Again, this program at AIJ is for Design for Good. The webcast series is funded by NEA with additional funding from IBM. We will have one last uh, webcast produced under this series on Friday, May 26th and we will address uh, design for veterans. I really en uh, encourage you to, to come and, and join this conversation as well. Thank you everyone and see you soon. Bye.